Hello, this is cognition. Cognition is a pretty big chapter when combined with memory. It is a good chunk of the multiple choice AP psychology exam. So what does this word mean? Well, if you look at it, if you've if I've taught you mental disorders, cognitive is just an adjective for thinking. Cognition is just a noun. It's the same word as cognitive. Cognition means thinking. And it also means thinking, knowing, remembering. So if I told somebody that their cognitive skills are limited, I just called them stupid. Okay. And so the whole point of this chapter, hopefully, is that if we can learn how we think, then maybe we could get better at it. And and just to sink in the term, Elizabeth Loftus is a cognitive psychologist. She studies reconstructed memories. Okay, so let's try this multiple choice. Cognitive psychologists are most likely to study what? The answer is A. The answer is A. Moving right along. Okay. All right. What is a schema? Now, I, I don't even think I have students write this down, but I think it's important. A schema is a set of ideas about something. And our, your stereotypes come from these schemas. So take a look at this picture. I mean, think about what is your schema for an office? Okay. Now, before we talk about this picture, think about this. Um, if I went to a pediatrician's office and I saw a Hooters calendar on the wall, I would think that was strange because that violates my schema for what a pediatrician's office looks like. If I went to a mechanic's garage and I heard him playing classical music really loud, that would violate my schema for what a mechanic's office would sound like. So a schema is a set of ideas that we have about something. So to, to hammer in the idea of a schema, check this out. People were asked about what they remembered about this picture. 29 out of 30 recall chair, desk, and walls, because that's what we would expect in an office. We're more likely to remember that. Only eight subjects recalled that it had a skull. Nine subjects recalled it had books, which it does not have books. So your memory for your lo a location is influenced by the person's schema for that location. So you remember what you expected to see. That's kind of like top-down processing, you know, or perceptual set in a way. All right. So let's talk about problem solving. How do we solve problems? Well, one way is trial and error. Okay, trial and error. Imagine this. Imagine um, I lock my key. I, I don't have a key to my classroom, so I go ask the janitor or the principal, "Can I have? Can I borrow your keys?" He says, "Here." He gives me like thirty keys, and so how do I know which key fits my classroom door? I just start trying every single one until I get it right. That's trial and error. All right. I normally don't have students write this down. Okay. Now algorithms definitely write this down. It is a logical step-by-step -step formulate method. Computers use algorithms. Okay, so it's step-by-step, -step, it's logical, they work, but they're not always practical. Okay, that's why computers are really good with using algorithms. So let me give you an example of an algorithm. Guess my phone number. Well, if you're gonna use an algorithm, this is what it would look like. Now, as you can tell, this is not practical for human beings to do. Algorithms are slow, but eventually accurate. Computers use algorithms. Now, if you were going to like hire somebody to do a job for you, an algorithm could be maybe a job application. You know, that would be, or if you're cooking something and you follow the recipe, that would be an algorithm, okay? And in class, this is where we watch a five minute video on the friendship algorithm, just for fun, just for laughs. You should watch that. Okay. It's ridiculous because you can't make friends with an algorithm. It just doesn't work that way. But that's why it was a funny skit. Okay. So type into YouTube friendship algorithm. It's a pretty good video. Now, we don't always use 
algorithms. We use heuristics. What are heuristics? They're shortcuts, okay? A rule of thumb strategy that often allows us to make judgments and solve problems efficiently. Rule of thumb is this. It means that I've done it in the past, it's worked in the past, so I'm gonna keep doing it that way. Like, for example, when the TV isn't working, so I hit it, I bang on it, you know, or if my remote control isn't working, so I take the batteries out and I put them back in, and then it just starts working. Okay, that's a rule of thumb strategy. Okay, so let's use an example of a heuristic. Who would you trust to babysit your child out of these two people? Well, your answer depends on your heuristic, okay? Uh, on your, um, it depends on what your heuristic. You may think that old women are better babysitters and young men are not. You know, that it would just depend on what your heuristic is, your stereotype is about who makes a better babysitter. I mean, you don't know who would make a better babysitter, okay? So heuristics are shortcuts. Um, but shortcuts are prone to errors. They're fast, but they are prone to errors. Like for example, what if this old lady is really a serial killer, you know, or she beats her kids with a belt, then your heuristic would be wrong, okay? Heuristics are shortcuts, okay? So guess my phone number using a heuristic. Well, if you're from my neighborhood, you would know that my phone number begins with one of these three area codes. And then of course, you'd have to use an algorithm to guess the rest of the numbers. Unscramble this word using a heuristic, a shortcut. Okay, so in the English language, you know that Q and U always go together. So put the Q and U together, and then you can figure out the rest. The answer is queen. But the point is, is that if you're going to do an algorithm, you would put the U before the Q and try all of the other combinations. All right, so let's try this question. Tyrone is trying to solve a complex anagram puzzle. He systematically tries every potential solution by testing each possible combination of the letters provided. Like a computer, he's acting like a computer. In this case, Tyrone is doing what? And the answer is A. Okay, remember to hit pause of the space bar if you wanna stop and think about it for yourself. All right, when confronted with the sequence blank in blank at the end of a word in a crossword puzzle, Tony inserts the letters I and G in the two blanks because that procedure has often led to the correct answer in previous puzzles. That's a rule of thumb. So what's, what's he doing here? He's taking a shortcut, so the answer is heuristic. Okay, because that's a shortcut. And he may have been right, he may not have been right. Kathy is learning how to cook. She follows every direction on each recipe step by step to make sure her food tastes good. Which of the following describes the problem solving approach that Kathy is using? Okay, step by step. The answer is A. Okay. Cheryl was trying to solve the anagram Tories by rearranging every letter one at a time until she was able to identify the correct word, story. She could have attempted to solve the anagram more quickly by pairing the common letters like S and T, but she did not do so. So she did a step-by-step. -step. What did she do? She did an algorithm. All right, moving right along. Do animals think? Well, there was a German named Caller, and he studied chimpanzees. And I have a one minute video that I show the class. Um, but what he did was he locked these chimps up in this cage, like a zoo, and he would give these chimps puzzles to solve. Like if he hung a piece of fruit from the sky and he left the tools laying around the enclosure, could the chimps figure out how to do it? Well, what he figured is that the chimps didn't use algorithms or heuristic. It was like, boom, light bulb. It just, I got it. Insight is the light bulb above your head. The, aha, yeah, that's it. 
That's insight learning. So insight learning is the aha moment. So you're just sitting there and boom, it comes to you. Okay. So the chimps didn't use heuristics or algorithms or anything like that. It just, boom, it just came to them like a light bulb above their head. Uh, I have students draw a light bulb on their note cards when they do that, when they drip, but make this note card. All right, so Chris has difficulty solving a physics problem in class. The next day, he sudden, suddenly, aha, suddenly thinks of a solution to the problem as he is watching a friend play the guitar. That is insight learning. It just, boom, it just came to him, light bulb moment. Eureka. Wolfgang Collar considered a chimpanzee's sudden solving of a problem evidence of, okay, sudden solving of a problem. Collar and his chimps, that is insight learning. That is D, insight learning. Okay. All right. And real quick, honeybees do seem to communicate through vibrations and through uh, pheromones. And Coco the gorilla was taught human sign language and so now the gorillas can't speak but they do understand language and they're able to express it through sign language if they're taught okay latent learning now latent means hidden for example um if you are considered a latent homosexual, that means you are still in the closet. You don't even know that you're gay, okay? You're just not out with it. Um, Freud talked about the latent content of dreams, meaning the hidden content of dreams. Well, latent learning is when you do it on accident. You do it passively. Uh, let me tell you, I want you to hit pause and read about this study about the rats, but let me tell you what really my example my wife watched cooking shows for years and I would watch them too. And, and I never cooked in the kitchen and I, I never really cooked that much, but a few years ago I started cooking and I actually really know a lot of stuff. I think I picked up on a lot of stuff from the cooking shows. I just picked up on it on accident. That's latent learning. Now here, um, the Matt's, no, sorry, rats wandered in this maze for 10 days, receiving no rewards or punishments or anything. They just walked around for 10 days. On the 11th day, food was placed at the end of the maze, and boom, the rats quickly found the food, which showed that they had learned their way around the maze without any real rewards or effort. Okay. All right. So Trisha, a first year student at a local university, is surprised to, at how easily she can locate the building and classroom for each of her classes on the first day of school. Trisha attributes her success to the campus tour she took the previous spring. Which of the following concepts best supports Trisha's belief? And this is latent learning. She did it basically on accident without any real effort. Now, why isn't this insight learning? Because insight learning requires an aha, a light bulb moment, a sudden realization of learning. And that's not what's happening with Trisha here. When Jo was young, her father was trying to learn how to speak French and would listen to French tapes for hours in her presence. Jo paid very little attention to the tapes. Many years later, when Jo was in France, she was able to say a few French words in order to make herself understood. So Jo did not actively try to learn French. She learned it on accident. This is latent learning. It's kind of like how students show up to class. They don't do anything, but they manage to learn a few things without any effort whatsoever. When Kara was eight years of age, she had a babysitter from France. During this time, Kara learned to speak It's like, uh, oh yeah, I don't, I don't want to talk about that. Okay, so what are some obstacles to problem solving? 
I mean, these are things that get in our way of solving problems. One is confirmation bias. Now, look at the root of confirmation, confirm. Okay, confirmation bias is when you, you kind of have your mind made up already and you are always looking for evidence that you're right and you ignore evidence that you're wrong. <clears throat> okay, teachers do this when they talk about, oh, Lord Jesus Christ, the moon is full, the kids are acting crazy. I hear teachers say that all the time. But what about times when kids act crazy when the moon's not full? What about when the moon is full and the kids don't act crazy? They ignore all that, but they only pay attention to the times when the kids act crazy and there's a full moon. Uh, your mom does this when, you know, you, you go driving and, um, and then she says you're a bad driver and then she'll only pay attention to your mistakes, but she won't acknowledge how many safe hours of driving that you have. So, uh, here's another example. If um, um, if you don't like somebody in your class, you'll pay attention to when they mess up. Hey, let's say you don't like um, a certain quarterback in the NFL. So you you pay attention to when they make mistakes, but you ignore when they make really good moves. That's confirmation bias. And you can see how people can be racist, because if you don't like a certain race of people, then you can only pay attention to when they you know, mess up. Okay, here's a cartoon on the moon thing. All right, now imagine if I gave you six matches and I put them flat on your table and I said, I want you to make, arrange these six mas matches into four equilateral triangles. Okay, so then you mess around with it and, and if you want to think about it, hit pause and think about it. Okay. But the solution to the problem is this. Fixation, and I don't have kids write this down, but fixation is the inability to see a problem from a new perspective. The reason you probably had trouble with the mat with that match problem is that you were thinking two dimensionally. You weren't thinking three dimensionally, which is the solution to this problem. So you were fixated in two dimensions. Fixation is not a good thing. Here's another one, and I have my students do this when we take a note card and I say, draw this box and the nine dots. Without lifting your pen from the page, can you connect all nine dots with only four lines? Hit the space bar if you want to practice this yourself. Here's the answer right now. The answer is boom. The reason this is an interesting puzzle is because you get fixated into staying within um within the box you know when there there wasn't any rule that said you couldn't go outside the box okay okay um functional fixedness this is not a good thing and i see this on the test a lot so make sure you write this down this is not a good thing fixedness remember that fixation functional fixedness is when you get stuck and within a certain mindset, you get stuck in the amount of uses that an object has. How many uses for a quarter can you think of? And if you could think of 10, then maybe you don't have functional fixedness. But if you can only think of one or two, then maybe you do have functional fixedness. So this is not a good thing. This is something that you want to avoid. Okay. So let me give you some examples of creative people who don't have functional fixedness. Okay, so they don't have functional fixedness. They're creative. These people are creative. Okay, this man does have functional fixedness. All right. Gabby uses a coin to tighten a screw on a faucet handle. This section shows that Gabby has overcome, and the answer is B, functional fixedness. Gabby has overcome functional fixedness. Okay. Serena is in a hotel room with a cake that needs slicing. 
but she does not have a knife. She goes to the bathroom and comes back with a long strand of dental floss, which she uses to cut the cake. She has overcome what barrier to problem solving? And the answer is D. By the way, dental floss is really good. Just don't use mint because then it'll affect the taste of the cake. All right, so let's talk about types of heuristics. And these are not good things. These heuristics often lead to errors. Okay, write this down. Representativeness heuristic. Now, I'll tell you what, I've been teaching this for a long time, and I don't see any reason to not just put stereotyping. All of the examples are about stereotyping, okay? And sometimes you're right, sometimes you're wrong. But check out Linda here. She loves books and hates loud noises. Is she a librarian or a beautician? Well, if you think she's a librarian, then you might be using your representativeness heuristic you're stereotyping okay when you say things like white people can't jump or you know you know things like that you know that's representing this heuristic which one of these people went to harvard okay now this looks like a trick okay and i get that um actually that um the girl on the left is a uh, she actually went to harvard okay um now i made this one this is not a trick Okay, who would you go to for math tutoring? Okay, it, it, there is no right answer, but the point is, is that um, based on your representativeness heuristic, you could answer the question. Would you go with the angry emo or the smoking nerd? Okay, and that's actually what I Googled in to find these pictures. Okay, all right, it, it, whatever, you know, it doesn't matter, okay, what the answer is. And then there's the availability heuristic. Make sure you write this down. If it comes to mind easily, then we're using the availability heuristic. All right. Um, for example, what, what kills more people, car accidents or anal cancer? Uh, I believe the answer is anal cancer. If not anal cancer, then cancer in general. Cancer is one like the number two or number three killer in the world. Heart disease is actually the number one killer of women in the United States, believe it or not. Now, we're always thinking accidents. Why do we think accidents? Because accidents are dramatic. They're scary. And we see them on the news. We see them on YouTube. So because they come to mind easily, then we assume that they're more likely to happen. That's the availability heuristic. Why would something come to mind more easily? Because it's scary and it's dramatic. For example, tornadoes. Tornadoes are scary. So every time a tornado comes toward my apartment, my wife is like, we need to go to my mom's house. And then I have to remind her that more people die from car accidents than tornadoes. And that's true. More people die of car accidents than tornadoes and more people die of anal cancer than tornadoes. But we think tornadoes are more deadly than they really are because of the availability heuristic, because they come to mind easily. If it comes to mind easily, we assume that it's more common. If you were to go into the Middle East, like, like uh, Cairo, Egypt, would you be more likely to be a victim of a terrorist attack or being in an automobile accident? The answer is automobile accident. Statistically, it is far more probable to be in a car accident in the Middle East than in a terrorist attack. That is true. But, but, but terrorist attacks are scary. They're scary, so we think they're more common. All right, so let's try a few. Paco is six foot six, weighs 210 pounds, and is very muscular. If you think that Paco is more likely to play basketball than a be a computer programmer, okay, so hit pause. Are we stereotyping here, or are we assuming that because something comes to mind easily that it's more likely to happen? The answer is A, we're stereotyping. 
Airline reservations typically decline after a highly publicized airplane crash because people overestimate the incidence of such disasters. Okay, so there's a plane crash. It's all over the news. It's scary. So we get extra scared of riding in a plane. The answer is availability heuristic. Having been told that Terry is an engineer and Alex is an elementary school teacher, when Arnold meets the couple for the first time, he assumes that Terry is the husband and Alex is the wife, rather than the opposite. So are we stereotyping here? Yes, we're stereotyping, it's A. Shaniqua used to enjoy eating beef, but since she has seen all the headlines about people becoming ill from eating beef, she has declined, decided that she will never eat beef again. Okay, Bluebell with its listeria outbreak, you know, we've all been through that. Um, so is Shaniko stereotyping or is she going with something that comes to mind easily? The answer is B. If it's in the news, it comes to mind easily. Okay. Okay, hit pause. Okay, this is an AP question. During a quiz, a student is asked, which is, a more, which is more common in the English language? The letter K is the first letter or a word with the letter K as the third letter in a word? Which of the following would be a student's likely response if he relied on the availability heuristic to answer the question? Okay, hit the space bar, hit pause and do this on your own. The answer is, a, because it comes to mind easily. Overconfidence. It's when we, we tend to be more confident than correct. Okay, we, we think we're right and we may not be. We're a know-it-all when we're not. We think we're a know-it-all. Okay, that's very common. Okay. Framing, this is important. The way a problem is presented can drastically affect the way we view it. Now, Elizabeth Loftus talked about this in the memory chapter. Also, if you watched Brain Games, season one, episode three, you learn that how you frame something can make a difference in person's memory of the event. So check this out, Which, what do you like better? 90% of the population will be saved with this medicine or do you like this one better? 10% of the population will die despite this medication. Huh, interesting. Now they say the same thing, but the first one sounds better because of the way it's framed. You should not drink more than two drinks per day, alcoholic drinks. Okay, that sounds okay, but what about this? You should not drink more than 730 drinks a year. Wow, okay, that sounds a lot different. So it depends on how you frame it. The abortion debate, do you support the murder of an unborn child? Or do you support a woman's right to choose her medical procedures and her right to privacy? How you frame the question does affect people's opinions on something. That's what politics is about, is to frame your opinions to get people to agree with you. Hit pause and check this out. This is really interesting, but I'm moving on. All right, so check this out. This is important if you want to be a lawyer. Imagine you're a juror listening to a lawyer examine a witness. What's the difference between these two questions? Did you see a knife in his hand? Or did you see the knife in his hand? Those are two totally different questions. Or even better, what did you see? But anyway, or what do you like for ground beef? 25% fat or 75% lean, which is better? That's framing, framing. Check this out, same newspaper, two pages apart. The black kid gets called a thug and the teen, the white kid is called a teen. That's sick. I think that's a British newspaper. Belief perseverance. The, the persevere means to hold on. Even now, your parents do this, I'm sure. Mo, a lot of people do. Have you ever argued with someone and you won the argument and then they say, well, I'm still right? 
No. Belief perseverance is when you cling to your belief, even when you've been proven wrong. So if the Cowboys have already lost eight games and you still think they're going to the Super Bowl, then you are totally having belief perseverance. You keep holding on to that delusion. Hindsight bias. Man, I just knew it. I knew it all along. Okay? So there's a kid in your class who gets in trouble for selling drugs, and you think, man, I knew that kid was going to get in trouble. I knew he was selling drugs. Eh, maybe you didn't. Okay? Maybe you think you knew all along. Or how about that Taylor Swift song? I knew you were trouble when you walked in. Maybe you didn't, Taylor. Maybe you thought you knew, but you didn't. Okay? Hindsight bias, or how about the election? Man, I knew he was going to win the presidency. I knew he was going to lose. Maybe you didn't. Your mom does that when you get into a car accident. She says, I knew you should have stayed home. I knew something bad was going to happen. And you're like, Mom, you always think something bad's going to happen. That's hindsight bias. Hindsight, think behind, back. It's when you look back and you think you knew all along. All right. My friends watched a recent episode of CSI and concluded that they, they would have been able to figure out who was responsible for a crime more proficiently than did the television investigators. I could have done it better than they did. The friends' overestimation of their ability to determine who committed the crime is most likely due to a reasoning error known as what? The answer is A. B, 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 sorry. Hindsight bias. I just knew. That's why when me and my wife are watching these kind of shows, I say, oh, he did it. I call it. So when I'm right, I can go, yay, I knew it. Otherwise, I, um, then there's the hindsight. No, you think you knew, but you didn't. Hal and Chris packed everything they thought they would need for a weekend camping trip. When it rained and they realized they had not brought rain gear, Hal said, I knew we should have packed raincoats. That's hindsight bias. For two years, I thought the answer was prospect of memory because remembering to bring raincoats is a task, but I was wrong. It's hindsight bias. All right. The researcher shows the same video of a car accident to two different groups of participants. Participants in group one are asked, did you see a broken headlight? In group two, they are asked, did you see the broken headlight? The researcher finds that participants in group two are much more likely to recall having seen a broken headlight, even though there actually was no broken headlight in the video. This is framing, framing, because you're playing with the way that the questions are framed or asked or worded. All right, new concept, moving right along. I want you to imagine a map of your school right now, or imagine a map in your head of Six Flags. Go ahead, do it right now. That is called a cognitive map. Map is a map. Cognitive means it's in your head. That's it. That's what a cognitive map is. Earlier, we talked about mice and a maze developing a cognitive map. It's a map in your head. A mental image of a spatial layout is called a cognitive map. All right, that's enough for right now. I'll do the rest on a separate video.